Well, good morning, church. I hope you had a great week following Easter. I know for many of you it was spring break week. Hope you had a great time. Got a little bit of rain yesterday and settled the pollen down just a bit. Uh, it's been pretty rough. It, it, it's really uh, funny that people, even with pollen, are afraid to cough because everybody thinks you just infected them. Uh, I know uh, it, it impacts me every spring. In fact, uh, water to prove that. Uh, this morning I thought I'd left my water bottle of water in the truck when I'd really left it out of the lobby. So I went and got another one, came in and saw the one I left. So I brought two in and I said to some folks, I said, it's going to be a long sermon today. <laughs> and uh, someone said, could we just give you a small cup and uh, go from there? But I uh, hope you had a great week. And it's great again to to gather to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who are joining us online, thank you for gathering with us in that manner. Well, we're going to continue our study in the book of Philippians. Today we're in chapter 4, so if you'll turn in your Bibles there, we're almost done with Philippians. Uh, today we'll look at the first five verses of this chapter, the fourth chapter. I want to ask you a question. When you think of the word church, what comes to your mind? Now, for most of us, the first thing that comes to our mind is a location, a facility, a place we go, or a place we join uh, through the internet. But really, when you look at the biblical definition of the word church, it's not a location, it's a people. In fact, the word is the word ecclesia, and it means a called out assembly. Uh, and and I, I, you know, you, you, don't, you don't need to, uh, to just get real legalistic about this. I, I say it too, and, and we do it. We talk about going to church, and uh, we certainly do come to assemble together. But it's even more important that we be the church, that we be the reflection of God as the body of Christ. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus said it this way. On this rock, I will build my church. And he's not talking about a brick and mortar building. He's talking about a people. And he says that when I build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You say, well, where did the, the concept uh, of church being a place, where did that start? Well, that actually happened much later in in an English translation uh, to mean the house of the Lord. But that's the English translation. That's not the, the biblical meaning. And not only is the, is the church a people, you and I are the church, but the, the church, uh, uh, the ministry of the church is to people. We minister to people. The body ministers to one another. The body ministers to those who, who are Christians and also to those who are not yet part of the body of Christ. But we have to be honest. Because the church is made up of people, it's imperfect. Would you agree with that? Uh, there is no perfect church. Uh, the only time there's going to be a perfect church is when all the church gathers in heaven to be with Jesus when he returns. There are no perfect churches. Uh, the church is imperfect because the church is made up of people. And we're going to see that today in Philippians chapter 4. We've talked about this church at Philippi a lot. And we said that, uh, that it was a church that, that had great unity, har great harmony. It was, a, it, it was a church that there's not much said about in a negative way at all. But they did have a problem. They did run into some conflict. So we're going to see that today. Philippians chapter 4 verse 1. Would you stand with me as I read? It says, so then, in this way, my dearly loved brothers, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. And now we see the conflict. I urge Euodia and I urge Sintike to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Thank you. You may be, be seated. 
You know, we really don't know what their disagreement was over, these two women. We don't know what they disagreed over. I, if, if you're keeping a list of things you want to learn when you get to heaven, you might want to write that one down. Uh, what were Sintike and Euodia, what were they upset with one another about? What was their disagreement? Well, we don't know, uh, but we do know this, that churches can disagree over the most trivial of things. I'm not saying what they disagreed over was trivial, but I will tell you, churches can disagree over the most trivial of things. Uh, this, is, this is, what I'm about to share with you is very true. I'm not exaggerating it a bit. I, when I was young, I'd just been called to ministry. I was not yet serving in a church, but I, was a, I attended a church on a Wednesday night. I went to their business meeting. I wanted to see how business meetings in churches were run. And so I went on Wednesday night, and this church spent over an hour uh, disagreeing over hymn books. Now, uh, they weren't disagreeing over whether to use them or not. They were not even disagreeing over what kind of hymn book to use. They disagreed over an hour as to the color of the cover of the hymn book. Will it match the carpet? Will it match the pews? What if we change the color of the carpet? I'm sitting there going crazy. I'm going mad. I'm going, just rip the stinking covers off the book, okay? And let's go home. I haven't eaten yet. Let's go. Let me go home. Let me go get some dinner. And, and, uh, but that, that was the argument. Well, I got to thinking about that. So I, I Googled, what do churches argue over? Listen to some of the things I found that churches have argued over. I, at least one church was arguing over the appropriate length of staff member beards. What, what was appropriate? Uh, another church was fighting over whether to build a children's playground. Now listen to this. Whether to build a children's playground or use the land for a cemetery. That was their argument. That's a no-brainer. Number three, there was an argument over whether the clock should be removed from the worship center. I say take it out because pastors can't tell time. You'll get that in a few minutes. Now you get it. Number four... Listen to this. There was a fight in a church over which picture of Jesus should be placed in the lobby. None of them are probably an accurate representation, so it doesn't matter. A business meeting erupted when people got into an argument over whether they should purchase a weed eater or not. And then the one that caps them all. This church argued over whether deviled eggs should be served at the church dinner. <laughs> you could balance it by serving angel food cake, just saying, all right. But churches can argue over the most trivial of things. I don't know what these two women were arguing over, but it concerned Paul. He was concerned that it was going to disrupt the unity of the church and thus disrupt the ministry of the church and the carrying of the message of the gospel from the church. So he addresses it. But what you have when you look at these verses are some, some subtle signs of healthy churches. What do healthy churches look like? Now, this list today is not in any way exhaustive. I could spend weeks talking about what healthy churches look like. But uh, from these five verses, Paul gives us a glimpse uh, very subtly into what a healthy church really looks like. So let's look at some of those things this morning. Number one, and we see it in the first verse, a healthy church exhibits God's love. A healthy church exhibits God's love. Notice the phrases that Paul uses to address the people at Philippi. My dearly loved, my joy, my longed for, and my crown. These are the words that he used. You could tell uh, without question that Paul clearly and genuinely loved the people at Philippi. There was an authentic love for those people. Churches need leaders who exhibit love to their people. Churches need leaders who genuinely and authentically love the church and love the people of the church. I have the joy uh, of coaching young pastors a lot, and, and um, I, I had the opportunity to talk to them about ministry and future ministry and things that are important. 
and I was addressing a, a group of young pastors uh, some time ago, and it was in a, in a setting where they were all young pastors there, and, and uh, new pastors, and, and some not yet pastors, and, and uh, as I stood that day, I said, I'm going to, in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to share with you uh, something that will improve your sermon 100%. Well, they grabbed out their iPads and their iPhones and, and uh, all their devices and some had notebooks and they got ready to write. I said, you won't need any of that. I said, if you really want to improve your preaching, learn to love your people. I said, 30 minutes before the service starts on Sunday morning, walk slowly among the crowd. In fact, that's one of the things I coach, is if you want to be an effective pastor, walk slowly among the people. I said, walk slowly among the crowd. And, when, and you've got that grandmother sitting over there whose grandson had a baseball game yesterday. Sit down with her for a few minutes and, and ask how the game went. Get to know her. Get to know her family. You've got a, a, a gentleman over here that, that's grieving. He, he, his wife just passed away, and he just buried her. And they've been mar married for many years, and he's lonely, and he doesn't even know where to turn or what to do. Sit down next to that man and spend a few minutes just loving on him and listening to him. And then you got this young couple over here with a brand-new baby. Just smile at the baby. Everybody gets excited when you, when you start uh, admiring their babies. Smile at that baby. Talk to the family. Ask them what it's like being a parent and that kind of thing. He said, what are you saying, Pastor Larry? What I'm saying is this. If, if, if church leaders will spend more time loving their people when they stand to communicate God's word, the people are ready to listen. People want to hear what they have to say if they know they genuinely love them. I was coaching a young pastor some time ago who was about to go to a church, and he asked me, he said, he said Pastor Larry, he said, what's the most important thing I can do? Kind of the same thing as this conference uh, topic. And, and I said, what I said there, I said, walk slowly among the people. I said, spend time with your people. And he said, well, well I, I get that. He said, but I, I've been told by, by, by those who have been teaching me in a formal setting, I've been told that, that I need to spend X number of hours on each sermon I preach. I said, let me ask you a question. How many sermons are you going to preach a week? I knew because I knew the church. He said, well, I got to preach Sunday morning. I said, I bet you have Sunday night. He said, yeah, I got to preach Sunday night. I said, I bet you've got to preach on Wednesday night, don't you? He said, yeah, I have to lead prayer meeting, and it's, a, it's another worship service. And so I've got to preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I said, well, you've been told you need to spend X number of hours on each sermon. Add up the hours. He said, well, there went my week. I said, you don't even have time to spend with your wife and brand new baby. He said, yeah, I know. I said, listen, what are those who have been teaching you have in common? And they're great men. Hear me. One of them is a very good friend of mine. I said, they're great men. They're godly men. They, they love the Lord. They love pastors. I said, but what do these men have in common? He said, they're smart. I said, extremely. Their, their theology is spot on. I said, yes, it is. He said, well, what else? I, 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 said, I said, it's none of those. Though. I said, what these men have in common, none of them pastor churches. I said, you have to understand when you're living in the real world with real people, you got to love them in a real kind of way. God says, love the body of Christ. But it's not just the leaders of the church. That should be true of every person in the true church. You see, the central characteristic of a church should be love. It's not the only characteristic, but it should be the central characteristic. You say, where do you get that? Only from Jesus. Listen to what he said, John 13, verses 34 and 35. Listen, he said, I give you a new command. He said, love one another in the same way that I've loved you. You must love one another. And then he says, now this is Jesus, not me. He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. He didn't say that your greatest witness will be the number of verses that you can quote from the scripture. And there's nothing wrong with quoting scripture. I believe you should memorize it. He didn't say your, your, your greatest witness will be from, from how well you can explain your doctrine, what you believe. And we should know what we believe and be willing and able to give an account for it. I believe all that. But what Jesus said was this. He said, if you really want people to look at you and see me, Jesus says... 
then love each other because when they see the love of Christ between you and the church, then they will be able to see my love. That's pretty important. Do you agree? Amen? That's pretty important. You see, we must love each other. You say, well, how is love seen in the body of Christ? One, genuine fellowship. Genuine fellowship. I, I could tell you this. When I'm in churches visiting, maybe speaking or, or, or whatever, I can tell what kind of church it is by the way the people talk to each other or don't talk to each other. Do they like to hang out together? Do they like to be with one another? Is there a genuine fellowship there? Another characteristic is genuine care. People genuinely care about each other and they minister to one another. A third characteristic is friendliness. Is the church a friendly church? I was doing an evaluation for a church some years ago and the pastor had asked me to do this with his people and so I was having a meeting with his church leaders and I asked the question, are you a friendly church? I, I, I didn't know the answer. I was asking them. And one lady sitting over here said, absolutely. Said, Pastor Larry, there are a lot of things we are not at this church, but I can tell you this, we're a friendly church. Her best friend was sitting right across from her. Hey, it may have been the two ladies like from Philippians 4. The lady sitting across from her said, well, Sarah, you're my friend and, and, and I love you, but I'm not sure we are a friendly church. And I said, well, there's two opinions. You say you, you are you say you're not sure you are, what's the difference? And the lady who said, I'm not sure we're a friendly church, made this statement. She said, I think we think we are friendly because we're friendly to each other. We're friendly to one another because we're comfortable with one another. We see each other all the time. She said, but I'm not so sure we're that friendly to new people who come into our church. And so from that, we began to work on some things they could do to reach out to new people coming into the church. Friendliness. Fourth characteristic is a church that really loves, like Jesus loves, carries out ministry outside the walls of the church. They not only work within the church, they not only care about each other, they care about the people who have not yet met Jesus. And they're willing, listen to me, I'm just putting it on the line. That church is willing to spend money. That church is willing to spend time. That church is willing to sacrifice. That church is willing to give up their own uh, likes and, and, and their own, uh, th the things that they would like to do most. They're willing to give all that up in order that people can hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a healthy church. That's a loving church. Well, A healthy church exhibits love. Number two, let's go back to the scripture now. A healthy church perseveres. Look at what he says. Paul says, he says, stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord, my dear friends, my loved. You see, not only must the church love people, it must have convictions. It must stand on the truth of God's word. It cannot compromise the Word of God. A church that, that, that is a healthy church is, is a church that knows what it believes and why it believes it, and it practices it. Listen, a healthy church is made up of people who don't quit. People who, who persevere. Listen, perseverance is a New Testament theme. Fourteen times in the New Testament, you and I are told to stand fast or be steadfast. Fourteen times. Including here. Listen to what the same writer, Paul, said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Therefore, my dear brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Even if no one, else, no one else sees what you're doing, if no one else is recognizing it, the Lord recognizes it. And whatever, listen, whatever you do for God is never in vain. It's never in vain. Whatever you do for Him. But folks, let's be honest. Christians can be very fickle. Christians can be very fickle. I had a gentleman one time, I asked him why he was 
doing church anymore. And he said, well, nobody ever speaks to me. Well, I just happen to know this guy. And I happen to know his pattern of church. He would always, without question, come in 10 minutes late after the church service started. Now, I'm not criticizing that. You've got to hear all of it. And as soon as amen, and sometimes before amen was said, he bolted out of the door and left. Nobody had a chance to speak to him. You'd have to run over him with your car in order to speak to him. But nobody speaks to me. Hey, by the way, I got to, if that, and, and I don't know that anybody feels so, but I've got an answer for that if that's how you feel. Nobody speaks to you. Listen to what the Bible says. A person who has friends will show himself friendly. I dare say that if you speak to somebody, they're probably going to speak back. I've not met anybody in Concord that didn't like to talk, okay? <laughs> And I've not met anybody yet that if I spoke to them, they just turn around and said, hmm, I'm not talking to you. So, folks, we have to demonstrate. To, we have to do our part as well. Do you agree with that? We have to do our part. But the, the key here is perseverance. It's not quitting. It's not giving up. It's not quitting when things don't go your way. It's not giving up when, when things don't move at your pace. It, it, it's persevering. It's staying committed to the work of the Lord through his church. I want you to listen to this. This is so convicting. A pastor from Zimbabwe was killed for his faith. And after he died, they found this writing. He had written this. Listen to what he said. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, led away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in a maze of mediocrity. Now listen, I won't give up, shut up, let up, or slow up until I have preached up, prayed up, paid up, stood up, and stayed up for the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a man that understood commitment. And he died for it. He was killed for it, but he would not give up. A healthy church perseveres. Number three, in a healthy church, the goal is God's glory. The goal is God's glory. Look at the second verse now. He says, I urge you, Odia, and I urge Sintike to agree, and the Lord, underline the little phrase, in the Lord. These two women are only mentioned in this passage. The only place by name where they are mentioned. But Paul says something about them that's very important in verse 4. Look at it. Or verse 3. He said, I ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side. Now, they were disagreeing over something, but they were genuine Christians. And they really loved the Lord, and they loved the church, and they had, they had walked beside Paul, and they had actually contended for the faith. It's very possible that these women were at the prayer meeting when the church of Philippi was formed. If you remember, I mentioned this when we started the study. The book of Acts talks about how Paul came into the region, and there he met Lydia, and he met other women who were worshiping down by the river. They were having a prayer meeting, and there he spoke to them. It's very possible those two women were there. You see, the church at Philippi was born out of a prayer meeting that was led by women. A group of women praying is the reason for the birth of that church. I know another church that is true of. It's a church. It wasn't born out of this, but, but it's very important to its history. It's a church I pastored for over 30 years. Now, it, it's interesting to me. I get asked this all the time. Pastor Larry, are you the founding pastor? Church was established in 1842. Do I need to say anything else? But in reading the history in the minutes, this is what I learned. During the Civil War, during the Civil War, 
The church almost closed its doors. Most of the men were off at battle. The church had gotten down to less than 12 people. They were discussing whether they should or could remain open or not. They only met once a month. But in the minutes it is stated that once a month, this one woman, this one lady, one lady, you don't think one person can have power in a church to see God do something? This one lady would walk down this dusty dirt road to the steps of Hebron Baptist Church in Decula, Georgia. And she would get on her knees and she would cry out to God to not let her church close. She would cry out, you're the God of heaven and earth. You created all things. And although the situation looks bleak and dim, and there are not many people left here, God, it is still your church, and I plead with you, I beg with you, keep your church open. And let me tell you, today is a testimony to one praying woman back in the 1800s to the power of God to keep the doors of a church open. Don't give up. But seek the glory of God. Listen, that's what you see in this passage. You see, these two women who contended with Paul for the faith, something happened between them that threatened the unity of the church. I don't know what it was, as I said, but it, but it, it was enough that, that Paul was concerned. Nothing. Listen, look at me and hear me this morning, church. There is nothing, nothing Satan would like to do more than destroy the unity of any church, including Concord Church, because when Satan can destroy the unity of a church, he defeats that church in its witness. He loves to do that. That's why, and you are united. That's why it's so important. You are who God chose to take the gospel to the world. We are as the church. Well, Paul says, I've got the solution to the conflict. It's right there in verse 3, or excuse me, in verse 2. Look at it. He said, I urge them to agree. Look at the next statement, in the Lord. In the Lord. Three times in this passage, Paul uses that Pray, stand firm in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord, and here, agree in the Lord. You know when conflict happens in a church? When we're more interested in our viewpoint than we are God's viewpoint. When we're more interested in our viewpoint than God's. You see, often in conflict, it's God who is forgotten. So Paul says, here's the answer. Just tell Iodia and Sintike to seek the glory of the Lord. And if they seek the glory of the Lord, they will come together. They may never be in agreement, but they will be agreeable. And that's important. That's biblical. Well, number four, a healthy church demonstrates joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again, he says, rejoice. We've spent some time there, so we're just going to touch on that. It's not always easy to rejoice. Joy is a choice we make. It's not a feeling. Did you know it's possible to be sad and grieve and have joy at the same time? Paul again said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, As grieving, yet always rejoicing. You see, you can be sad, you can grieve, but have joy knowing that God is still in control. And God is still there. And he won't leave you or forsake you. That's where the joy comes. Not based on circumstances, but the Holy Spirit. And then number five, a healthy church practices gentleness. Look at what it says. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. He says, even in handling conflict, be gracious. Speak gracious words. Have a gracious attitude. Be gentle. It's easy for us who have been Christians for a long time to forget what it's like to be newly saved. And sometimes we're, we're extremely harsh when we need to be gentle and we need to be gracious. That's a characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit, by the way. And then Paul tells us why we should be. Look at it. He says, the Lord is near. Now, there's two translations as I close. There's two translations or interpretations of that statement. 
What does he mean? The Lord is near. Does he mean Jesus is coming soon? Make sure there's unity in the church because Jesus could come at any moment. Can I tell you? Jesus could come at any moment. <laughs> that is a true statement. And I believe it can very well be interpreted that way. Protect the unity of the church. Protect your witness because Jesus is coming soon. But there's another interpretation and it is this, because God is among you. Don't forget when you meet, God is there. You say, well, which interpretation is it? I think it can be either one. I think both are correct. That's one of those like the multiple choice questions you used to get on exams where A and B both are right. I think Jesus, I know Jesus is coming soon, but let me tell you, we also need to remember every time we meet, God is here. He is here. And every time we meet, there ought to be one desire, and it is that God be glorified. Can I ask you, church? Is that true? If so, say amen. Let's glorify Him. Let's pray. Father, Thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for a reminder of what a healthy church looks like. And thank you, Lord, for Concord, a church that is healthy, a church that, that, that strives to demonstrate joy and, 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 and gentleness and, and desires your glory. And, Lord, a church that, is, that perseveres and loves the way you love. Father, may each one of us characterize those principles. May each one of us live those out in our lives because we are the church. May we be an example that others can see and thus see you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to give this service to our campus pastors, to those who are in the room and those who are watching us online. This morning, I'm just going to ask you to continue to pray for our church that we will exhibit the things that we've studied today. I want to thank you as a church for the way you do exhibit these characteristics. You're a witness all across North Georgia. But you know, maybe today you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus. You've never trusted him. But you've seen it in the lives of people around you, people in this church. And you want to trust him as Savior. If you're in the room this morning, as soon as this last song is over, there's going to be prayer partners standing at the front of the worship center. And I invite you to come as we had one do after the Easter service last Sunday. And say yes to Jesus Christ. And not only in the service, but last week before the service ever happened. During the week, we had a young man say yes to Jesus. And you can do that today. If you're online, you can do that as well. You say, well, I can't get to that stage area. You can email us. You can call us. Let us help you know Jesus is your Savior. I'm going to ask you to stand at this time and let's sing to the glory of God. Let's sing as a church, as the body of Christ, giving our worship and our praise to him.